Good evening, I'm Jose Cardenas. Thank you for joining us. Arizona voters made their choices in this year's primary election. We'll have analysis of the results, a look at the winners, non-winners, and matchups in the November general election. Now here to talk about some of the races are Mario Diaz, president of Mario E. Diaz and Associates, Jaime Molera, partner with Molera Alvarez, and Rudy Espino, assistant professor with Arizona State University School of Politics and Global Studies. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us on Horizonte. We're going to get to the specific races and some of the numbers and, and, and the matchups, as we said there. But, but what are the overarching messages, maybe some things that people would be surprised to hear about that come out of this election, beginning with you, Mario? So this idea that uh, unions, labor organizations are dead in, in Arizona clearly is a myth. You have United Food and Commercial Workers, plumbers and pipe fitters, the carpenters, uh, they all came out in support of very specific candidates that we'll talk about later on in the show. But the unions played an incredible role monetarily, uh, physical, uh, and, and efforts, a sweat equity into these, into these races. And so Arizona labor organizations alive and well, something to look at for the general election. And we're going to want to talk about that more specifically. So, Jaime. I think that uh, ideology matters in primaries. I mean, the, the old adage that liberals win uh, Democratic primaries, conservatives win Republican primaries is still the case. There's this notion that, well, maybe we can get these independents out there and it's going to materialize. We can have this some soft center. It just doesn't happen. In primaries, you have to run to the base, and the base gets out the vote. And Rudy, we were talking off camera about something you observed in terms of, of kind of same old, same old in many respects in Arizona. Uh, yes, this is exactly what Jaime, in fact, was talking about just now uh, with respect to primary voters. They tend to be very ideological. And the national media is really focused on the Arizona Republican primary. Um, it was competitive, and what did we see emerge is the most ideological candidate in Doug Ducey. Another thing, too, is the role of um, independent voters and early ballots especially. So many early ballots are being cast in each election cycle every year, every year. and you see Doug Ducey was going after that early vote, early, very early, um, and that, I think that made the difference. And so by the time that Smith got the, the big Brewer endorsement, it was a little bit too late, and perhaps that was the big gaping hole in his campaign strategy. So you talk about the national media. There was an article in the New York Times this week that talked about how, the, with the exception possibly of Smith, the GOP candidates were focused on immigration, which seems yes. at odds with the notion that Arizona's uh, Latino population is going to be increasingly influential here. And yet, that's what they were hitting. Yeah, and the question I often get from people outside of Arizona is, why has Arizona not swung to become like the next Colorado, the next Nevada, the next New Mexico, where this Latino vote becomes influential. Um, in part, it's part of our primary structure, um, but there's other things perhaps we can talk about is the nature of the Democratic Party here, um, the structure of our electoral process that all play uh, into um, this factor. So Mario, let's, let's begin by talking about the, the governor's race. Uh, Ducey won, um, uh, perhaps uh, by a bigger margin than people would have expected. Uh, this, this is true. Uh, look, this race between uh, Treasurer Ducey and Fred Duvall is not going to be a cakewalk for, for Ducey. I think Fred du Duvall uh, is very well prepared for the next 43 days. And let's keep that in mind. The ballots come out in the next 43 days. And Fred has been sitting on a significant amount of political campaign contributions. And there will be other entities uh, outside, whether people do not like dark money or green money, whatever we want to call them, the money's going to be there. And, and there's going to be significant push to get Fred elected. Jaime, mean, did Fred sit too long, though? I think he did. I, I, when the Republicans were, were just killing themselves and they were going after each other and calling each other all these kinds of names and throwing out all this vitriol, in my opinion, I think um, Fred Duvall could have identified himself. And right now, starting today, he started his own uh, air campaign, his TV campaigns. Well, so did the Republican Governors Association, who's going to pump in about $1.3 million, 300000 just this weekend. And all they're going to do is uh, try and identify Fred. Now, it may not be fair, may not be accurate. All these people are upset that they're claiming that he's the one that personally led the 900% increase in tuition or whatever it was. But, but when you don't define yourself, other people in a political vacuum will define you. And that's exactly what's going to happen right now. So, Rudy, you already mentioned uh, the governor's race a little bit in your opening comments. Other observations? Uh, little, uh, just to extend a little bit on what Jaime's talking about, the Duval sitting and waiting reminds me a lot of what Carmona did in the senator, our last senator's race, where Jeff Flake, Will Cardin were fighting it out. 
and Carmona was just sitting on the sidelines and it didn't work out for him. It was a little bit, you know, it was a little too late by the time he got his name out there. And what did the Republican Party do at that time? They already labeled him as connected to Obama. And this is what the RJ is doing, right? They've already connected Duval to Obama. It's an effective campaign strategy. It was effective in 2010 midterm election, midterm cycle. It likely will be effective again in 2014. Now, we also talked when, when we were with you uh, uh, just a moment ago about the the immigration bashing and so forth. And yet some people are saying, I heard somebody on the radio uh, driving over here today, say that the key for Ducey is gonna, to, gonna be to swing back to the middle. Do you think that's really the case? Yeah, he'll have to, because um, he's gonna turn off certain moderate voters and even perhaps some conservative Latino voters um, if he continues to take the stance that he had during the Republican primary battle. So, but presumably other forces, uh, outside uh, forces, whether it's dark money or green money, mm -hmm. um, uh, will, be, will be doing some of that dirty work for, for Ducey and, and conversely for, for Duvall. Well, it's not uh, like what do you it, see there? It's not like Fred Duvall has been laying out in, in Santa Monica and getting a, a tan here, <laughs> <Yeah>. gentlemen. Uh, <laughs> this, this, this individual is, is completely politically astute. And he has been planning, he has been laying out his economic development plan at some point, independents that come from Republicans or Democrat parties, they're going to say, I'm tired of this bashing of border bashing and immigration issues. What are you going to do for my family? And Fred is going to be ready. And I think Doug Ducey is going to continue to play from the same Republican playbook and try to do the scare tactic, and it's not going to work. What about in independence, Jaime? Mean, we, we touched on it a little bit, but, but the numbers were actually kind of impressive, at least in terms of participation. It was. It, it went from uh, traditionally what's been a um, 7 or 8% independent voter turnout in primaries to about a 14%. So certainly what uh, Scott Smith did was actually fairly impressive. Um, there were a number of other organizations that put in money to try and get independents to understand that they have a voice. But the bottom line is, is that the bulk of the voters are still going to be driven, as we talked about, by ideology. And in the general election, it's my opinion that uh, Democrats start out with a huge gap. They're 100 and about 70,000 votes behind Republicans. In terms of registration. In terms of registration. And this is a cycle in an off-year election when the president is so uh, damaged politically that this becomes a, a, a moratorium on, on Barack Obama. And Republicans are excited to vote, and they will get out there and vote. National trends, national polling is showing that. Democrats, not so much. So what they have to do, the, the Fred Duvalls of the world, the Rodolinis, the Terry Goddards, any other candidate, they have to bring out their base. They have to get them excited. But at the same time, they have to get a significant amount of independence to say, yeah, it's worth voting. And they have to capture, maybe it's Republican women, maybe it's the conservative Latinos. But they have to do that. And it's not that easy when you're talking about a very short time frame, because it really is. We're talking two months here. And that's why it's so difficult for Democrats in this cycle to be effective. Now let's talk about something that's mm -hmm. rare in its occurrence, though perhaps not that surprising that it happened this, this time around. That's the loss by two incumbents, beginning with the Attorney General. Attorney General Horn, I understand, has uh, now conceded the race to Brnovich. Right. Well, as an incumbent that lost myself, so I have some experience in this matter. But I, I think... In fact, I think you were the last one. I think I was the last one. That's right. Um, I think it, Horn had just taken way too many body blows. He, he, he just was constantly, um, every other day, there was a story about him being implicated in a particular campaign finance violation, um, a personal scandal. Um, and if you look at the, the polling data, he really took most of the blows in Maricopa County where the stories were constantly out there. In the rural counties, he didn't do as bad. He was actually able to, to maintain a lead over Brnovich and do fairly well. Um, but that's what really did him in, was that it, you just can't constantly sustain that. Same thing with John Hoopendahl. John Hoopendahl, I said, not only shot himself in the foot, he shot himself in the head, the chest, and every other extremity that he could find. <laughs> and when you do those kinds of things, you tend to lose. So uh, in the Hoopendahl case, uh, uh, Rudy, uh, it, there were, were all the self-inflicted wounds, of course. But he also um, uh, was beaten by somebody who was campaigning against Common Core. How much of a factor do you think that was? Um, it, a huge factor, because uh, Common Core is something that is, it's, and it, I think it's going to be a bigger factor in the general election, because Common Core is one issue that I think unites Democrats and Republicans, liberals and conservatives, that they're both opposed to it. So campaigning on it and framing Hoopenthal as a supporter of Common Core, very effective. Mario, your thoughts on these two incumbents <clears throat> going down? Well, it was a disaster uh, for the Republican Party, and, and Felicia Rodolini in the Attorney General's race is, has, is a seasoned pro. 
And we have... Uh, she almost beat Horn last she time She almost around. beat Horn last time. Uh, Mr. Bernabich is, or Vich, I'm sorry, is, um, is a rookie. And uh, I don't know if he can handle this pressure. Felicia is going to come out hard and strong, and she's very well liked by both sides of the party. Uh, on, on the Hoopenthal side, not since Governor Raul Castro has there been an elected Latino, uh, and da Dr. David Garcia uh, could become that. Of course, uh, Jaime, our friend, uh, was appointed, uh, but elected. Uh, David Garcia has a, a solid chance against a novice, a person who was starstruck uh, during the primary election while she was being interviewed by uh, newscasters. Uh, th this, is, uh, this is a race for David to, to, to win or to lose if, if he doesn't do the right things during the campaign, which is work hard, continue to work hard. Now, what about his primary, though? Um, uh, I think some people were surprised that it was as close as it was. Yeah. Look, as long as he has 50 plus one, that's all that matters. <laughs> it's, a, it's a new day. Uh, it was close, uh, sure. Uh, but you know, to me, t today, the day after the primary is a new day. And, and uh, he's starting off strong already. And uh, I'm hearing from Republican friends that he's very well liked. He, they feel comfortable with him. Military background, a PhD, a kid that came from uh, low economic means. And this is the American story and the Arizona story. So it looks like we may well have a, a Democratic office holder in a statewide um, a position. Uh, Jaime, uh, what do you think about that? Do you think David's going to win the general? It's going to be difficult. Uh, regardless, I, I, I think uh, Mario's right in that his challenger is going to be shown to be extremely extreme. I mean, she's about as extreme as they come in the, in the Republican circles. And the thing that I think David, but also a lot of Democrats tend to do, they talk amongst themselves very well. They, they go to the union uh, rallies and they go to the worker group meetings, but they don't get out to East Valley and West Valley. And they have to, going back to my original point, mine Republican votes. They, you just have to. In a state like Arizona, you can't sit back and wait for people to come to you. You have to be much more aggressive. And aside from, honestly, Rodolini, who's had experience in that and I think did a good job against Horn in showing herself to be a much broader, more of a business community type candidate. I haven't seen that yet from the other candidates. And that's where the Democrats have to be very aggressive. The other one we haven't talked about is Terry Goddard. And Goddard also has that experience. So it'll be interesting to see. You have some very strong candidates on both sides of the aisle that I think will make this an interesting uh, general and election. And you're talking about the Secretary of State's race. Correct. So uh, uh, Rudy, uh, does the fact that David Garcia's last name is Garcia help or hurt in this general election? Uh, moving forward to the general, well, it depends where in Arizona we're talking about, you know, and, but um, of course your heavy Latino uh, precincts is going to, that Garcia name is going to resonate. Um, so he's going to have to work really hard not to, to benefit or try to bank on his last name, but really work hard to court those white independent voters and talk about his credentials, his experience as an educator, and why he would be the best candidate. Um, and, you know, pick up on what Jaime was saying, I think that even if Garcia, you know, on paper may be the best qualified candidate, the thing that's hurting him and all other Democrats is Barack Obama. We saw this with Carmona, I, mean, I said this already, we saw this with Barack, uh, Carmona in 2010, it was a referendum on Obama in 2014. It, it's, it's still going to be a referendum on Obama and it's going to hurt the um, Democrats overall. Mario. Um not as surprised as, as the campaign was moving along, but, but I think at the outset, people would have bet that Mary Rose Wilcox was going to be the next uh, congressperson from CD7. What happened? I think that, that seat uh, was, uh, was kept warmed too much for her. And, and um, here, here's what happened, uh, is, is that uh, there was a, a sense of complacency, not deliberately, but she never had a competition in the last several elections. Her voters are older voters, institutional voters in the community. They move on, they pass on. Uh, you have a young man in, in, in Ruben Gallego who's uh, dynamic, energetic, military, gung-ho. He worked hard, very hard, and I give him credit for that. You know, I, I supported Mary Rose Wilcox uh, because uh, so much she's done in the community. But this is the changing of the guard. You have it with uh, Ruben Gallego, you have it with Steve Gallardo, uh, you have it along the lines in different positions uh, where the Latino community said it's time for, for a change. And not only that, talking about the broad appeal, is that this district is not completely Latino. You have a, a sizable African American, uh, African -American mm -hmm. and Anglo and gay LB, LGBT community. And Gall uh, Gall uh, Gallego, 
really went out and, and solidified uh, that community early on. Mayor Rose stayed on as supervisor too long, in my opinion. So, Rudy, uh, uh, does uh, Gallegos win have any coattails of any kind in the general election for uh, Democrats or for Latinos? I Frankly, it's such a safe seat that if he wants to, Gallego doesn't have to campaign. He can just sit <laughs> on his laurels and just coast. But he seems to me like the type of candidate that really does want to work for the party. And I imagine that he, you know, he had a very effective micro-targeting campaign. His door-to-door -door ground campaign was just really impressive that I think it's probably something that he would want to test that out again and probably try to help ensure that there are more voters that turn out to support fellow Democratic candidates such as Duval. Mm -hmm. so, so Jaime, your observations on TD7? Well, I, I think Mario hit it. Um, Ruben did a very good job of reaching out to millennials, those that are the 35 and below. And, and that is over 50% of the Latino population mm -hmm. now. If you look at from 18 of uh, registered voters, between 18 and 35, and Ruben understands that, un and very similar to Barack Obama, and, and I liken it to what Obama did against Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton, similar to Mary Rose Wilcox, was kind of the establishment candidate, had a lot of the you know, traditional backers. Uh, and Ruben went out there and just grabbed those votes, grabbed those young people and got them excited to vote. I think long term, though, for the good of the, if he wants to grow in the party and if he wants to be seen as somebody that can be a change agent, change agent um, you look at the total vote in that district, it was 24,000 votes total. That was about half of what Republicans come out to vote in those uh, congressional districts. I think he needs to do a better job, just like all Latinos do, of getting people to come out to vote. And, and I think, but for he has an edge, he's starting with that young population to get them in the mindset, that's what I have to do. So, and I assume it was because of, uh, uh, the fact that he, he associated with young people, that the Wilcox campaign tried to uh, paint him as an NRI t N NRA type, right. uh, uh, a gun supporter. Um, did it just have no impact or, or did it have a negative impact? From what I understand, in terms of Wilcox? <clears throat> from what I understand, I, I heard it did have an impact. I mean, it, it, polling data shows that, you know, a lot of Latinos are um, against and they want to see more regulations, especially in these urban uh, areas uh, that uh, Mary Rose represented. And because, remember, she, her background was that she was shot as a public servant. So I think she had a good story to tell. But at the end of the day, it, it, it didn't resonate with voters because, again, Ruben has a lot of credibility. As, as Mario said, he, he's a veteran. Uh, he went to Harvard. I mean, he's just got a good pedigree. And quite frankly, he just worked. He's a very well, solid and, campaigner. And, and look, and, and the professor has an iPad in front of him. I have, I have a piece of paper. <laughs> uh, this, uh, this is, this is the, the campaign for, for District 7, which was the technology. Uh, this is another subplot, uh, the technology versus the old school. Uh, and, and they had it, and she didn't. And I know she worked hard. But when someone comes and knocks on your door six, seven, eight, nine times and mentions Ruben Gallego's name, which is what they were doing, it's hard, it's hard to beat that. And right from the get-go at 8 o'clock when the when numbers came out, he was up 3,000 votes and he won by 3,000 votes. Mm. Yeah. So I don't think you're that old myself. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but we've touched on this several times, and that is the, the race to replace Mary Rose Wilcox on the Board of Supervisors. Um, Gallardo won. Uh, any surprises there, especially with respect to Michael Johnson? I, I, don't, I, th I don't think so. As I said at the beginning, the, the unions played an incredible role in specific elections with Jim McLaughlin, the president of the United Food and Commercial Workers, the quiet one, uh, John Laredo uh, doing the, the, the campaign strategy and, put, and implementing it. Uh, and Steve Gallardo and Ruben Gallego were their candidates. And, uh, and, and once again, Mike Johnson uh, has done so much in the community. But when it comes down to uh, legwork, knocking on doors, that will typically win a, a local election. And yet, um, uh, Rudy, Marie Lopez Rogers had some benefit, I assume, from being the, the incumbent, at least for a short period of time, and she comes in third. Yeah, uh, a little surprising there, but it, again, it goes back to the effective campaign strategy. Um, and, and, you know, usually for incumbents, name recognition matters, but for an office like that, you know, a lot of voters are not typically paying attention to you know, if you ask the average voter, you, do you know who's serving on, you know, the county board? They, uh, I don't know, yeah. right? Unless there's a scandal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, so most voters, you know, income, the name recognition usually matters for those big state offices. Um, and so in some ways, it's yeah, surprising, but not all too, given that what office we're talking about. Jaime, something that, that attracted a lot of media discussion was whether the, the T7 
Tea Party, the, maybe the far right wing uh, of, of the Republican Party, was going to exact revenge mm -hmm. for the votes in, in terms of, of the expansion of, of Medicaid. Uh, and they seem to have failed miserably. Well, it was. And, and, and in one a lot example, ways, we want to put the numbers up on the screen is, is the Worsley election. Right. In some ways, that, that is very true because a year ago, at the height of the whole Medicaid restoration expansion debate that was just engulfing Arizona, the um, extreme hard right was making predictions that anybody that sided with Brewer that took a vote uh, with her, the Republicans in the legislature, were done politically. Their careers were over, they might as well just quit. And, and, and Worsley in District 25 was one of their big targets. Exactly. And Worsley, along with everybody else that voted with the governor as a Republican, won. And even John McComish, who left the legislature but ran as a justice of peace and was targeted by the Tea Party, said, we're not going to give him a, a reward for voting on Medicaid. He wins, and he wins mightily. But there was uh, a, in other races where I know the business community, the governor, wanted to try and uh, challenge uh, other Republicans that were against Medicaid uh, didn't fare so well. So Tea Party and hard right uh, politics did play in a lot of races. And in, in a lot of ways, it was a draw. The governor was able to keep those folks in place, but wasn't able to also increase their advantage in the legislature. Rudy, what do you think about that in terms of the, of the Tea Party's influence in this election and what it means in the general? Well, I don't think that the Tea Party is going away anytime soon here in Arizona or at the national level. I thought they were when they first came on the scene, but they've been, you know, it's this organic grassroots movement, so they're still around. But uh, the fact that the, this debate over the Medicaid expense, which was in, you know, infighting within the Republican Party, and the fact that you see these Republican candidates all win their elections, I think in some ways says that that battle is now over, right? And now the Republicans are, have put that behind them, moving on, you know, and Brewer is stepping down, you know, and so we don't have that name to associate, you know, oh, you're connected to Brewer. Mario, we've made some references a couple of times to the, the so-called dark money. And the races where that seemed to be the biggest issue were Corporation Commission mm -hmm. and also Secretary of State on the Republican side and the money that was supposedly supporting Justin Pierce. Uh, your analysis there. You know, I, I have uh, uh, no doubt that, that um, uh, the third party uh, dollars uh, played a significant role in these elections, particularly in the Corporation Commission. But uh, until the Supreme Court, until the nine members uh, get another case and, and reverse uh, the case that allowed this to happen, we're going to see this. And this is America. It's uh, freedom of speech. Uh, it's a right uh, to uh, advocate for candidates. And this is the law. So what, what can one say? Uh, and you've already indicated that, that some of this money wasn't so dark. I mean, it was pretty open, the union's involvement, for example. The unions, you had Mr. Parsons that, that uh, uh, popped uh, you know, $5 million for Ms. Ms. Jones. Uh, it has his name on it. Uh, that was green money. Uh, you know, it, it, and until, until the laws are changed, nothing's going to change. And uh, we just got to... Uh, deal with it and, and, and try to educate people about it, but at, at the same time, it's a right. And very quickly, um, and we popped uh, this number up a moment ago, and maybe we'll get it back, but Senate District 27, yeah. uh, and, and also 28, some, some interesting races there. You had Miranda uh, winning in, in 27, and, and I think 28 may still be a tie um, between uh, Quesada and his opponent. Yeah, so Hernandez. Yeah. Twenty nine, yeah. rather. Yeah, right. twenty nine. Yeah, twenty seven. Uh, Marquez, young young uh, fellow, uh, military background, uh, came in like like uh, Pancho Villa, uh, <laughs> wanting to change the world in, in one election. And uh, I think we have to understand that sometimes you have to pay your dues. And so uh, Se Senator Elect Miranda won that. And, and it's a tight race between uh, Quesada and, and, and Hernandez. And, and we'll, we'll see what happens there in the next and, few and days. I think the legacy of Ben Miranda, her, her, yes. her former husband, who, the late Ben Miranda, still casts a long shadow in that community. Sure. Ben was very well liked, very yeah. well regarded, was seen as a very strong advocate for Latinos. And Catherine is, is actually a good campaigner. She works hard. Educator. Between yeah. those. Yeah. Uh, two things, I think that uh, that helped her out considerably. So there was a lot to talk about. I think we've covered some of the big bases here, but, but I'm afraid we're out of time. No, no, I'm sure we'll have you all back to talk about the results after, after November. Good. Thanks for okay. joining us. Thank you. Starting next week, Thursday, September 4th, Horizonte will be moving to new time slots, Thursday nights at 11 and Sunday afternoons at 1. Please join me at our new time starting in September on 8HD. 
That's our show for tonight. From all of us here at Horizonte and 8, I'm Jose Cardenas. Have a good night. I was going to say John Wayne, but... Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station.